right, Pete. Kanikin wo atia tiatahei. Hika ne haunitin noye. As far as uh, why I wanted to choose an actual minor in American Indian Studies, my family would always take a lot of vacations out west, and um, primarily my mom, um, she would read us a lot of history on uh, Native Americans and whatnot. It was just really a different kind of history that you don't learn in your standard textbook, or it's just only in a little paragraph. Um, but it's it's one that's uh, got a sentimental like kind of value, especially to our family that. Uh, touches pretty deep, um, and that kind of explains why um, I play lacrosse, the sport of lacrosse, one of the two native sports of this continent, um, was for that exact same reason. <laughs> My overall goal is to be a music therapist, um, and I figure um, along with being a therapist is learning many different types of cultures and how people think and how um, they perceive the world. I thought it would be really cool to um, learn a different um, native language mm -hmm. than um, my own. I don't really know my own. Um, I'm mute, and so I don't know much of my, my culture. Um, so I just thought it'd be really cool to get some of some type of native culture into my life. I've been coming down here like for about nine years now. I come down here, we have rep with uh, students here in, in Laramie. I bring a culture and language down to them, you know. Nuhu nehe na he he No, he he ho. He he ho. Arapaho is an indigenous language. Um, it is in danger of being lost. There's fewer and fewer fluent speakers, so this is an attempt to reclaim the language. Um, for the Arapaho people, and there's also a lot of scholarly interest in it too. You get not only the language, but you also get a bit of the history, a bit of the stories, and for me, it's the combination of the language and the stories and the history that's really important. I bring our language, and I, bring our, I, I tell stories, you know, stuff like back home. Something like we have Indian foods and Indian stuff. And then I kind of spread a goodwill to all the non, non rappers. You know that we're still here in Wyoming, you know. This was our home. Lerm was our home. Those I live on a uh, Wind River Reservation, and um, I am part of the um, the Northern Arapaho Tribe. We're nearing 10,000 membership. Only, uh, I would say, maybe 175, 150 can carry on a conversation. Well, I'm, I'm from Riverton originally. Um, my family doesn't live on the reservation, but they're Arapaho. Um, and my grandma was uh, like one of the youngest of ten children and they stopped teaching the younger children um, Arapaho. My husband is Northern Arapaho, um, he's, he's brown um, and he, he's one of like Wayne has said many times there's a lot of people on the reservation that know a whole bunch of words, a whole bunch of vocabulary words in Arapaho but he doesn't speak fluidly. Many of us in the class, myself included, take what we learn home to teach to our family at home. I have a seven-year-old who's a, enrolled Northern Arapaho and since we're away from the reservation, she doesn't get the same exposure as her little cousins who um, are around their Newa who, you know, speaks fluidly every day. So she doesn't get that. So whatever I can take home kind of makes up for being away from home for the time being. I'm going to get together with some of the other ladies from my class that also have children. And just um, probably, you know, easy stuff like play games and do like objects. Um, we learned how to play Go Fish in Arapaho. We did that last week. So. <laughs> One of the fun things that um, we're doing downstairs that we actually like to come up here is to play Go Fish in Arapaho and it helps us learn our numbers and our colors inanimate and animate and we say Go Fish Naye. I like Naye. <laughs> what is Naye? It's fish. It's go fishing. Go fish. Naye. Our efforts have, have only um, uh, 
have manifested themselves in being able to identify certain things like certain animals and say that this is a dog, that is a horse, this is a cow, and uh, this is red, this is white, that is black. But it doesn't say anything, there's no interaction. We have to get our people to interact and to be able to speak to each other and understand each other. For this, for colors, we just have a few color words, but we have them singular and plural, animate and inanimate. Animate colors and inanimate yes. colors. So colors they, that do things and colors well, that don't so do So that things. you can say a red ball would be different than a red bear. Everything that, that we uh, talk about uh, has a gender of being animate or inanimate. And what makes that very, very complicated is animate is generally something that you associate with something living. But, but in our culture, those things that, that, that are held with them uh, as probably being sacred are described to be animate. We talk about them as if they're alive. And then this, this, this that is very difficult to learn, um, just teaching it, you know, it, you know it's very difficult. Uh, the door, like even the door to this room here, is animate. The window is inanimate. And uh, uh, things here like, you know, like a rock is animate, a uh, feather is animate, and a teepee pole is animate, but if it's in a forest, it's inanimate. <laughs> this is why I say it's so, so simple, but yet it, that makes it so complicated. What is ha -ha um, your son. A spoon is animate. A fork is inanimate. The only way that I know how you can tell is um, uh, you have to, you know, you'd have to have learned that um, uh, as the first language. It's been 20, 30 years since I played this. So. The Yahoo ice cream. Yahoo. So yeah, my kids know animals. They know eat because I tell them that. <laughs> Beef the heat, <laughs> eat your food. Hasnana. Hasnana, hasna, hasnana. Hasnana. When I do my homework, my husband laughs and he says, you know, you're going to know conversational rap whole way better than any of us. And, and that's the way it is. Um, and that all kind of came about from the boarding school era. And people over 40 were in boarding schools and they were beaten for using their native tongue. Our national goal, the assimilation of American Indians into white mainstream American culture. And that has resulted in policies and schools which denied the privilege of speaking your language, the right to speak your language to the children. On the, and punishment has been meted out over the years on the basis of that. So, you know, a lot of for the last 40 years, a lot of people have not spoken the language around their house or encouraged their children to teach it because they remembered the penalties that they paid for speaking it in school. It's become very, very alarming that um, who we are, our identity as a people, is um, uh, to a point where that um, uh, we're losing, uh, losing um, uh, our identity. And by identity, I refer to our life ways. And our life ways um, are expressed through a language, a language that is unique to our people. Chief sees a chicken. Hanana na 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 ha befi, he say he ha. My students are learning how to speak the Hinan Ait, the Rapa language, using grammar. You know, it's a new form of learning the language. The way I learn the language, hearing it all the time, it's gone. I was immersed in language, you know, from when I was a baby to about th third grade. I, I spoke good, good rap huh? just by hearing it and doing actions like TPR type of thing. But these guys, we use grammar, you know, suffixes, prefixes, stuff like that. Nanahawati. Why is it Nanahawati and not, no, Nahawat? You can't pluralize a verb. You can pluralize objects and, like, nouns. One of the interesting things for me about the Arapaho is that 
you had some of the major anthropologists studying the Arapaho in the 1920s. Um, and so you've had a long history of anthropology, but they would not necessarily have used the same alphabet as we are using today because it wasn't invented till 1940 by Danny Salzman. Um, the kind of earlier Arapaho alphabets had lots of accents and um, sort of special notations, whereas the one that's used today doesn't, the o it has an um, apostrophe, and that's the only, it has an apostrophe and a three. The letter three is the sound for TH, but otherwise you can, you can absolutely type it on a typewriter um, or a regular keyboard. You don't need any special symbols, which is one of the reasons why he developed it in the 1940s. It's a beautiful language in that you kind of match, there's a sort of melodiousness to it. And one of the features of the melodiousness is that you um, match uh, prefixes and, and with the words that are going with it. So um, like a bear is a wach. And if you were going to say my bear, you would go na wach. Um, whereas um, if you were saying spoon, which is hebeyo, you would go ne hebeyo, which is so wach is an o sound, na wach. Um, ne hebeyo, my spoon. Ne ne hebeyo. What she said was this is a spoon. You know, we work with lots of papers rather than a formal textbook. Can I go home and organize my notes again? But we're trying to work towards a formal textbook, and that's an interesting process to be part of. One of the ladies told me that the alphabet was, she was dead set against it when it first came out. <clears throat> She's like, I didn't want anything to do with it. It shouldn't be written. I don't. She's like, but now I'm seeing why, why we need to have it written. Why it needs to be written down. Not necessarily learn it better, but um, document it better, so it will survive longer than just orally. For me, one of my goals with this class is to have more people, especially coming from the reservation, who are comfortable not only speaking the language but analyzing the language and, you know, dissecting it so they can teach it in a way that is more comprehensive. That is a goal. Um, people are kind of working parts and pieces and we're eventually going to get together and combine all that into a, a good textbook that we can use down here as well as on the reservation, um, CWC or the high schools or, or tribal college. I think it would be wonderful if we could have that draw of, you know, connecting the university with like the tribal college and the reservation. When an indigenous language, when any language, is, any language drops below 200 fluent speakers, it's on the critical list. And the native languages spoken in, in Wyoming, uh, Arapaho and Shoshone, are, I think, both in that condition. So it's essential, if you're going to preserve, preserve the language, to preserve the culture, and vice versa, that you have fluent speakers, and you must begin early you end up in the condition where we are right now, with most of the fluency uh, possessed by the old people. It is only natural that within a few years that these um, uh, speakers will, will be gone. And then each time we lose a speaker, there is no replacement. Our young people that we are trying to um, uh, instruct in our language, it's, it's very slow. It is a very slow process. I'm like 67 years old. But it's not heard all that much anymore. You might hear it at senior citizens or centers, you might hear it there. But at home, you know, I have nobody to talk to at home. My brother, I talk to him when I see him. You know. If I see a rapper, I say, hey, I'll go see the rapper, I'll go talk to him. Hey, my friend, hey, talk to him. What are you doing? We talk rapper. We talk our own language. I seek out speakers when I go to that casino someplace or a basketball game. Mm -hmm. It is a guy still and we see that we talk rap. It's a beautiful language. It is very, very imperative that um, our culture, our culture is meaningless without a language to interpret it. Our words have meanings, you know. You have to be an Indian to understand those words. Yeah. Words have feelings, our words have feelings all the time. Yeah.
Nieto, na nakabehit, na nakchak. We got possessive stuff on there, and we've got some of this um, proximate opiate stuff on there. I understood this lesson better than I have most of the lessons in the past. Our program isn't like other languages. We have three teachers, four levels, all in one classroom. We don't turn away anyone because we want to build a language community. We want people with passion to come and embrace the language and do their absolute best to not only, you know, learn it, but become part of the language and let the language become part of them. And then, no, no, Hobbit, say, I just feel like there is such a danger of it disappearing that I feel almost like an urgency to get it back in my family and to like be able to have my daughter know it. So I don't know if I'll be around to be able to to, to really know how successful we were, but in the meantime we're we're gonna be teaching other other people. Other people, you know, that I, I call them paraprofessionals. We we teach them the uh, orthography. The grammatical structure, and um, uh, they can use in that. You know, uh, uh, they they cannot converse with each, uh, each with each other, uh, but uh, uh, they understand, and then they'll be able to to um, enhance what what is learned in the earlier years. Pete, can you see now what he said? He can. If the language was lost then there is a certain way of thinking that would be lost and we wouldn't have that anymore. It would just be gone forever. So I just think it's just of utmost importance to reclaim it. <laughs>